What's up, everybody? Welcome to the first episode of the Legacy Podcast, where we talk about lots of beautiful things like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, mixed martial arts, boxing. We talk about the streets, the music, and we bring it to you as real as it gets. And today, I'm very excited because I got one of my closest boys with me, my boy Manny Majares, who is many things. He is a producer, director, engineer, uh, music video producer. <laughs> he is a boxer, and he is my purple belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as well. That's right. I got to get that brown belt. I'm coming for it this year. What's well, up? next year. Next year. By the end of by this time next year, I'm coming for that brown belt. Oh, you're going to get it, bro. It's, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, as long as I've been doing this, it's just such an important thing for me to have to do every day. You know, it's like if I'm not doing it, I, I'm going to get I'll get in trouble. I need to be on the mats. I need to be training. I need to be at the gym. It keeps me grounded. So for me, it's like I I don't sometimes I don't understand that people get busy and they have lives outside yeah, of it, right, you know, right. because I, I coach. So I I'm, I get confused. Wow. Why, why aren't they training? But I, I understand as I'm getting older and, you know, it's it's a hard sport. So. Um, yeah. I mean, it goes to show like the people that do get their brown belts, purple belts, brown belts, black belts, you know, there's a level of commitment that you, you know, that you have to have. Yeah. I think it's gotta be like kind of part of you in a way, like where you cannot not do it anymore. Like I, I have to do it no matter how hard it is on my body or whatever, I, I need it for my mind. I need it for my soul. I, I have to be on the mats. It's the best thing for me. I remember one day Master Joe said, you know, after I got into some trouble again as I got older, he was like, he's like, you need to be on the mats. On the mats is, is, is where you need to be. You'd be safe here, my friend. And I was I was like, okay, he's he's got a point because every time I strayed from, from being on the mats, my life was not good. So Yeah, I think someone like you, like, really needed jujitsu right I, I think like just from what i know about you and i'm gonna learn more today but it's one of those things where you know it saved your life it absolutely 100%. you know what i'm saying like and and it's like that for a lot of people especially those that come from like less fortunate circumstances or bad lives and you know childhoods where they don't have like you know a lot of things they need something you know that's why you know i i think a lot of people you know they find like their core group of friends or their, their people that they end up calling family, you know, because they can, you know, they, they really find something that, you know, takes them there. So, and I think that's what you found with jujitsu. So I think that's really special, man. Yeah, bro. I mean, when I've heard a lot of people say jujitsu saved my life and <laughs> I literally, it's am, true though, right? For me, one, I don't know for everybody and maybe it does for everybody, but for me, 100%, I, would, I don't know what would have happened to me at that point in my life. I can't even, I get nervous. I get, like, scared to think what the fuck would have happened to me. So tell me, yeah. what was the first time, like, you even, like, walked into a gym? How old were you? And what made you go into a gym? Hmm. So, okay, yeah, um, the first time I walked into a gym. So the, re the whole reason I even went to a gym was because... I wasn't, I had gotten, I was in jail. I was in jail for a while. How old were you? I think I was 20, 20 years old or, or okay. 21. Okay. Yeah, I was in jail for a, like about a year at that point. And, you know, when I got out, it was like, it was real. It was like, I saw so many people go in, come out, go in, come out. The same guy. And I'm thinking to myself, what the fuck are you doing? You just went out two weeks ago. They violate probation. They come right back. It's like they wanted to be there. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want. I saw that shit with my own eyes, like every day. And then, so you had gotten out of jail for the first time or for the second? Like, no, it was <laughs> okay. Like I was going to jail a lot, and okay. it was a matter of time where it was going to be some time, like long term. And that year, I got lucky that I even got what, that but, year. Okay, so let me back up a little bit though. But what, like, what do you like? What makes someone like go to jail all the time? Like, what, do you, like? What are you doing or what are you not doing to kind of stay out of trouble and keep yourself, like, focused? You know what I'm saying? You know, bro, like, when I was younger, I mean, look, I, I grew up in the 90s, you know. I, I'm growing up in the 90s, and you got, 
the popular shit was rap music and 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 being a gangster and and girls and yeah. drugs like crazy. We're in Orange County. I mean, California. You know, this was the mecca of like everything. Good weed. Uh, people were doing speed. People were doing drugs, and it was that was what was cool at that time that I was growing up. And so for me to like my, all my friends that I lived on the same street with, they were all like doing that. I wanted to do that too. I wanted to follow in those footsteps. And with that came doing smoking and, and doing and doing those okay, things. Okay, so just getting so, into so, like yeah, trouble. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, going, going to jail because now your parents don't want you at home because, you know, you're, you're doing bad shit. You're smoking weed. You're, do, you're hanging out with your friends. You're doing stuff you shouldn't be doing, you know, with kids that want to be, you know, show-offs, okay, you know. Okay. And then you end up, you know, out there, and then all of a sudden you need money. And then so for money, what do you end up doing? You just end up jacking people doing, you know, things that, you know, just to get anything you can to get money so you can get that. And then because of that, you start going to jail. And then when you go to jail, it gets real for you because when you get there, you know, it's time to realize, like, that's not where you want to be. I don't care how tough you are. I don't care how uh, cool you think you are. When you get in there, they will all beat your ass if you think that. Well, I mean, it's not just that. It's that there's something about, like, not being treated like a fucking human being. Like, so, like, like putting you in a cage, in a cell, and giving you rules and you can't walk outside if you want to. You can't eat when you want to, really. I mean, if you have commissary and you have chips and, you know, ramen and shit like that, I mean, that's cool. But I, I think that what what it was for me was just not being in control of my own life. Yeah. Where you feel like, you know, a, a caged animal, like in a shelter. And it, it, that, that actually can drive you crazy. Yeah. And you're already in jail, so if you get crazy when you're already in jail, mm-hmm. then it make then it makes it that much worse, and then you spend more time, and people will test you, yeah. and so it gets. But I'm but actually I want to back up even further than that. Um, were you born in Orange County? No, I was born in Boston. Okay, I was so born you in Boston. I was born in Worcester, so, Massachusetts. Okay, and then I and then I lived in Boston. And then we moved to New Hampshire, New Jersey, and then we moved to Westlake in L.A. When I was like. I was probably in fit like five, like five years old. Okay, and then yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, so but so I'm East Coast. But yeah. where? But Man. your family? But your family originally is from Iran. Yes. Okay. Persian. And and were your parents? Um, actually, I don't even know anything about your mom or your dad. Are yeah, you, my my parents are full Persian. They were born in uh, Iran, Tehran. Okay. And uh, they, you know, I think they were in their early twenties. They moved from Iran because Iran was crazy you know at that time it was Iran and Iraq were in a war for eight years and you know a lot of Iranians wanted to leave that area and my parents they got married they met they got married they moved to uh, America and that's where they moved to they moved to Boston my dad was like really good engineer and all that shit okay okay and so yeah we moved there and that's where I kind of grew up and then we from there graduated moved to L.A. Yeah. Uh, so your parents are still together, and they're here in Orange County. They're they've separated a couple times, but okay, they're together okay. now. And okay. Yeah, they're here in Santa Ana. Okay. So you got in the city, Santa Ana. What's up? So you. Represent. So fast forward, you started getting into trouble. Yeah. You're going to jail. Yeah. You know, you walk into a gym. What brought so, that? So on? I'm getting in trouble. I'm I'm going to jail, and before I was going to jail, like one of the th- only things that was good, positive that I was doing at that time was. I I had I had fallen in love with rap music and I remember you know the first time I heard a song and it made the hair stick up on my head because of the lyrics and I was like I have to do that's I have to make somebody feel that it was just that. cool right it was Man, one of those things I'm where telling it's like, you it was like a it was like the best feeling I I don't barely ever get feelings like that when I hear music anymore yeah. but when I felt that as a young kid I remember that's what I want to do I want to make people so, feel so like so so let that. me ask you let me ask you a question about that because I, I I tend to agree but I struggle with the question of is it because we're older Right, like, is it is is the music different? Is the feeling different? Is the culture different? I think the answer is yes, but do people 
still get that feeling with the music today. Well, the, the thing is, if they listen to my shit, they probably say, this shit sounds like some <laughs> old ass shit. But the thing is, like, there is definitely some good music out today. And you're making a lot of it yourself. I, but I mean, what, there's what, some good music, but I, I, I think... I think in hip hop, is there, is it even? It's tough for me. You know, it's tough for me to think of who I like. That's I now, mean, can you really call it hip hop? I'll tell you what. You I, know, think, it's I rap, think. I think. I think someone that has a very good style right now, and I would say he's the best lyricist and and rapper. I would say is Kevin Gates. Yeah. Kevin Gates is probably um, the most versatile rapper that I I would listen to because from rappers now that that's kind of who I listen to, and I think I think he's got a Real big mind too, so yeah. I feel okay, like I, so I relate to. I mean, it sounds like you're. Like, it was kind of hand in hand. Like you heard, you know, you were getting into trouble. You know, you're going to jail, doing you, rap music. You listen to music. Yeah. You get into a gym, and it's kind of like both, like pop culture. This world kind of just expanded and blew up for you. Yeah. So. <sighs> So what happens is I finally get out of jail and I realize that that's not what I wanted for my life. And um, at the time when I got out, I had a homeboy named Slick. Shout out to Slick, my homeboy from Santa Ana. Um, yeah, we started doing music together. We, we we started like making a lot of songs. And and one day I was like, man, we got to do something with this shit. So I made, I pressed up some CDs and we were, I had gotten out of jail and we were in Palm Springs. And in Palm Springs, there's a strip. And on the strip, on the, I think it's a Thursday night or something. They have a whole bunch of vendors. It's on like that main, yeah, 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 oh, yeah. Okay. that main street when you get off the one eleven or whatever. Yeah, the one eleven, and that whole street gets piled with vendors and stuff. And I, I, so we take like a box of CDs, right? And I'm like, I'm that's kind of a random place to take, but I, I mean, because there's not a lot of. I, I wouldn't imagine there's a lot of like gangster rap fans in Palm Springs walking the street. It wasn't the the gangster rap fans. It was the way I would convince people to buy my yeah, cd yeah so i went this we go on the strip we're there for like 30 minutes all the cds are gone i'm heading back with a stack of cash like that and i start counting i'm like okay and then i got some money together and i made real cds then i started treating it as a profession and yeah actually when i met you i probably sold you a cd <laughs> well actually actually you did yep. but you were like you actually approached it in such a professional, like entrepreneurial way, where you had to go and sell a certain amount of CDs every day, like it was your job. Yeah. Like you would go out and even you'd come to my studio after and you'd be like, okay, cool, I just got done selling this amount of CDs, <laughs> like every time. And I think before, before I even actually met you, I think I met you in at the outside of the Brea Mall. I think you were selling CDs outside of the Brea Mall in the parking lot. Yep. Um, because I remember seeing you like in an elevator at Villa Siena, um, and then and then you know we got to know each other a little bit more, and I was like, I think that was, yeah. I think that was him. But, I, I've always, <laughs> but 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 I've always respected that hustle because a lot of people don't, they don't do that. No, they don't. He, they he, just think it's you know. You're, you're making music for fun and someone should do something for me because I'm making cool music. Yeah. But you were the one that was out there slanging CDs like traditional old school way. And it, you're right. You're absolutely right. It wasn't, they obviously didn't hear the music, but it was the way that you approached it and the way that you sold right. it. And it wasn't like on some Venice beach type shit where it's like, here, take my CD. Yeah. Now you got it. Give me the $10. No. No, I had a, you know I, what I'm saying? I had a, I had the perfect, pitch and i would talk respectfully to people i i had people telling me my mom bought my grandma bought your cd the other day bro i would talk to everybody because yeah. i knew how to do it and i knew if i wanted to if i wanted to get my music out there this was the thing right i thought it but when that night i realized like i can make money doing this i don't have to sit in the studio and just hang out with my boys all the time i could take my music yeah. i could get on the streets and i could hustle and i started treating it like a job no bullshit. I was making two hundred fifty dollars a day cash. Between I would get up, and that was my quota. I did that seven days a week for fourteen to fifteen years. No bullshit. That's crazy. I opened up my That's own. A, yeah. I opened up my Respect. own gym. I, I I moved out of my parents' house. I got every. I got did everything for myself because of those rap music that you see on that table right there, and you know, 
the good thing about it is when I was doing the rap music, I realized, hey, I got to get my fat ass in shape. And I had been into some fights in the county and stuff, and I was like, I had been in some riots. So I was like, you know what? what like, this would be kind of cool to start working out. So I started working out, and I do start doing some boxing and stuff like that. And as I'm doing the boxing, I'm watching the UFC on TV. And it was the old UFCs. Back in those days, they actually didn't even have gloves. Like, and what I what I miss about the UFC actually is they would put people up against each other. They would say, "This is guy's karate. This guy's wrestling. This guy's sumo. This guy's boxing." You know, it's so hard to do that nowadays because everybody knows everything. Because yeah. because people got smart when Royce Gracie was kicking everyone's ass. Yeah. They're like, "How is this little guy? Yeah. How is this little? I, I mean, he's not little, but how is this guy that's like?" You know, he's not some big, muscular guy. You know, he's wearing this baggy suit, and then all of a sudden he's, like, you know, tapping these people out. So I think that's crazy. Yeah, you know what it was for me? It was just watching them. I was like, oh, that's fucking crazy, right? I'm looking at, I'm watching these dudes, like, strangle each other, and I'm like, this. I want to know, like, what? how do you do that? And so as I'm working out, I'm selling CDs every day. And so I'm in the streets. No bullshit. One day, I'm, I remember I was at this Stater Brothers parking lot, right? And right in front of my eyes, I see this white truck, and it has the word tap out on it, like gigantic on it. And I was like, tap out. I was like, I'm selling him a CD. He's probably cool, right? Because, you know, yeah. probably somebody that does that shit or, or whatever. So I, I, drive, I, I drive up, pull up on him, I sell him a CD, and I'm like, at the end, he buys the CD. He was, cool, he was a cool dude. And he, I'm like, hey, where do, you, where do you do that stuff at? And he's like... He's like, oh, go see my brother Kurt. So, brother. so this is in Palm Springs. This is in Palm Springs. Okay, okay. So yeah. this is while you were selling CDs. Yeah. You said, okay, I'm gonna go sell this dude a CD. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, I'm selling the dude a CD, and I'm like, where, where do you, where do you do that? Because I wanted to see what that was like. I wanted to train. And I wanted to know. And then he's like, yeah, go see my brother Kurt. And my brother Kurt's got a gym. I don't remember the name. He, they were, they were in like some type of uh, sports complex. And so I went there. And I trained, and they were all, let's just be fair, they was like, you know, they were all some professional fighters and much better than I was when I first went. And well, I hope so. <laughs> the only thing was that they were training on the rug at the time. Okay. And, and I was like, my what a rug. Yeah, for my first, like, that's the, crazy. Yeah, well, you know, that's OG. I, I, I mean, that's. Hey, that was like, you know, a long time ago. And then, I don't know, I think he was in a transition from a gym to another spot was going to open. Yeah, but so I love that. I learned on a rug. Yeah. Like I fl- rug burns. Like. Yeah. It was, it, was, uh, it was crazy. And then, so I'm, I'm, I'm training there. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to deal with it. And then four days in, I sell a CD to my brother Gilbert, who's actually now my black belt. Shout out to Gilbert. Um, yeah, I sell a CD to him, and he gives me a flyer for this guy named Palm Springs Jiu-Jitsu, Ramon Diaz. Okay. And, like, I call him up, and he's like, yeah, we got Cub Swanson over here who fights in the UFC. Shout out to Cub, my boy. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go train, train at Palm Springs Jiu-Jitsu. I went there, and I, and I trained, and I, keep it real, at the time there was a lot of good guys at that gym, and but they were all cool, and, and I trained there, and – I started going there. I was like there for three, four months, and and that's where I kind of like started the bug hit me. Okay, you know, and I started doing jujitsu, and then my parents were like, "We're moving back to Santa Ana." I'm like, "Oh just shit!" Just as you start to feel like you're fitting into something, I just I it's probably like four months. Four okay, months in, yeah. Okay, I'm like I'm like oh man. So I I go to the gym and I tell them, hey, you know, I was so nice training with you guys, but I'm moving to. Orange County, and I'm going to try to find somewhere to train out there. And, yeah, we moved back. And I was faced with a big decision when I So you So you're a white here. belt at that point? Yeah, well, I'm not even a stripe yet. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So you're a white belt at that point. You go to Santa Ana, and... I got a choice to make now. Okay. Am I going to follow the footsteps that I built from getting out of jail in Palm Springs and, like, doing music like I was, selling CDs like I was, um... You know, recording all the time, um, <clears throat> stacking money, and you know, starting to do martial arts, starting to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Like, you know, I did martial arts as a kid too. So this was like me being finding something to be passionate about again. Or are you gonna go back to hanging out with the homeboys again? And Lord knows what's gonna happen to you. Yeah. So that was a big point in my life, and and I'll be honest, when I first got back here, bro. Phew, 
I, I went to a bunch of gyms. Uh, like, no offense to any of them. Like, I'm not, I don't even need to mention any names because I'm not, I'm not like that. But I went to, like, about five different gyms, and I just, like, oh, man, this is not the vibe. They're so not- tell me, it's interesting that you say that. Tell me what the different vibes are. Like, if you go to one gym versus another. Because, I mean, a lot of gyms actually look different. Yeah. Right. The, like there's there's very traditional. There's very laid back. Like what are some of the differences in, in gyms in, in jujitsu? I think like for, at that time when I when I got there, like I remember one of the gyms I went to, I had already been rolling for three, four months. And they were like um, they, they taught me the technique and the class was like cool. And I was like, yeah, this is cool. And then it was time to roll. And they were like, oh, you, you can't roll yet. I'm like, what do you mean? I can't roll. I, I've been rolling. They're like, oh, you have to have like a stripe or something like that. Uh, before you can roll and i'm like i stripe to roll i've been rolling for three i'm sorry but that's how yeah we, we, okay so scratch that you know so, so would that you vibe. say that that's more like traditional or, or is it more like corporate like like who you, who you, would do that you know i think like it's back then i didn't want that because i had been rolling right yeah. but if i'm gonna be i'm not gonna hate on that because i do understand you know um a coach wanting to protect these brand new people that start jujitsu because let's be honest, those are the ones that mostly go away. The ones because they come and they get their, you know, they get hurt. They get their arms yanked on too fast. They get yeah. choked too hard and they don't know what's happening because the people that are rolling with them, you know, are at a higher level and they want to like, they want to, they want to try all the moves they're learning on yeah. this kid. So those people don't stay. So I kind of understand it now. So in retrospect, you uh, I agree with that? <laughs> I'm not going to say I agree. Okay, okay. But I think the coach should like be like, this it's up is to his, the coach. Yeah, this is his first, my opinion. This is, uh, for example, Johnny's first day of jiu-jitsu. Okay. I'm going to, if I'm running the class, I'm going to make sure that Johnny goes with such and such who is a higher belt that knows like I don't want I want I would like this kid to keep coming to this mm-hmm. class so be you know he's not going to go crazy on the kids going to be you know there when you do jujitsu for long enough you should be able to be comfortable enough to be able to control someone and be especially a beginner you know and and and, and treat them well so they want to come back cuz otherwise you won't have those training partners you got to be able to keep people that come in yeah so that vibe like there's there's a way to do it I think that's my opinion, though. I, yeah. I, I'm sure every other teacher has their own opinion. So, yeah, I mean, I come back, and I'm looking for all these gyms, and I can't find nowhere to go. And I'm starting to hang out with my homeboys again because get, I'm getting bored. I'm, I'm selling CDs, and, I, like, I want to do stuff. Like, and I, could, I, I went to a few gyms, and I'm almost starting to just say, oh, you know, fuck it. Like, I, was, I guess it wasn't for me. And then uh, I called Ramon Diaz. Rest in peace, Ramon Diaz. Um, well, I don't want to get into that yet. But, yeah, so I called Ramon, and um, Ramon tells me, why don't you go see Master Joe, Master Joe Marrera? I'm like, I don't know who that is. But I'm like, okay, who's that? And he's like, oh, the, you know, then you'll still be part of our team, and that's my coach. And I'm like, oh, okay, there's teams. I'm like, I'm still this new. Like, I don't okay, understand okay. all that. And so – um. Yeah, I called Joe, and I, as soon as uh, Joe, like, I was talking to Joe, I didn't understand a word he said. Like, I, <laughs> I talked to him on the phone. I told him that, you know, it was like, I could, I'm like, he's like, yeah, my man, like, the first time you hear a Brazilian strong accent, you're like, I cannot understand a word yeah. Joe, Joe said. So I called the uh, my my old coach, and I'm like, hey, do you, do you know where it's at? So he gave me the address, and I showed up. And then right away, Joe, like, you know, put his arm around me and, 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 that night when I met Joe, like, he literally put his arm around me and told me, he's like, I'm going to make you good. This this would be a good place for you, my friend. You know, one day you, you, you're you going to you – because I had already been training because he watched okay. me train, and I, I think he saw something in me okay. at that time because he really, like, brought me in. Just all he had to do – that that's the way that man is, you know. He's – He's so like he's like a godfather, right? You know, he says something to you and you believe what he's saying. Yeah. And I believe like right away, I'm gonna be good at this. I'm gonna be a teacher one day. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a good fighter. I'm gonna be a good teacher. And and I I just dove full in and and I said, you know, um, fuck it. And I, I trained three times a day, every day. How far from where you lived was Joe's two streets. Gym. Like it was oh, like wow. Yeah, I was on I was living in Santa Ana like 
off Bristol and like MacArthur, and he and his school was off Baker and Grace Lane okay. in Costa Mesa. So it was like five Very minutes. Close, yeah. Five minutes. I sell okay. CDs in the morning. I'd get up extra early. I was like, I want to be in every class. So I would. Sell, I was addicted. I have an addictive personality, and I felt like I had a family, and like this was my. Yeah. This was gonna be like keep me out of trouble, and like. Yeah, you would just go every day. Every day, I would sell CDs in the morning, go to morning class, and then uh, Joe, and then at the time Marcelo, they were teaching privates and stuff, and <laughs> they would ask me to stay and help them with their. I'd stay, help them with their privates. I'd come back, help with kids class. I train with the kids. I'd help teach with the kids, and then at night I would train oh, in the adult great. class every day. That's great. Yeah, I've like full on, and then um, you know, I think I was a blue belt, and I think I was starting to sh- like go out a little bit with my friends again and joe kept telling me okay. like joe kept telling me like he's like man you got to stay out like the streets and stuff don't don't you know don't hang out with those those guys you know like you, you, you're you like past you like you moved on now it's like yeah. you, you know yeah you got something good going on and then uh one night i uh i went out and that night i got stabbed i got stabbed like um Multiple times in my face, yeah. in my head, in my back of my head, in the back, in my back, and I was just like, I like I couldn't see because I was just covered. I was drenched in blood. I had I had cuts like coming down the sides of my head, across my cheek, and and like I was like literally just wiping blood because there was like thick wow, like gashes, gashes. Yeah, I was like I couldn't see, so I I, I had you know they had. They had jumped me in this in this spot, and then somebody had stabbed me, and then they, the person that was getting stabbed, started getting jumped. But I, I, would, I just needed to get to see what was going on, so I start moving away, and then I realized, like, damn, I'm bleeding a lot. Like, so I, I, I was bleeding to the point where my shirt was drenched. Like, like I took my shirt off, threw it on the ground, like right away, it was drenched with blood. And I remember I ran out the cul-de-sac, jumped in my car, and I drove backwards out the cul-de-sac, and I turned around, and then. Uh, dr- I was starting to drive towards like my house area, and then I called I called Marcelo at the time, and um, I was like, "Hey, I, I'm I'm I got stabbed." He's like, "Are you all right?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm 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 I think." And when he said that, it clicked in my head like, "Hey, bro, you you just got stabbed." Because I said it out going, loud, yeah. yeah. And so he's like, "Are you okay? Do you need to go to a hospital?" I'm like, "Oh shit!" I think so. So, yeah. so I look up and like. I look in the rearview mirror and then I can see like the cuts on my head. And then I reach back and touch the back of my head and the back of my head. There's like the flap was like hanging. I could felt, I felt that I'm like, Oh shit. Yeah. I need to go to the hospital. He's like, he's like, okay. He's like, where are you? I'm like, I'm on the freeway. He's like, can you make it here? I'm like, yeah. So I, I made it there and he gets in the car and he like, soon as he sees me, he literally rolls out and falls on the ground and starts throwing up. That's how covered in blood I was. He said, I, oh, I think man, that's crazy. Yeah, I was I was drenched. And so he gets a towel and he gives me a towel and tells me to put it over my face. So he, he's like, I can't look at you. I'm sorry. I, I, I can't look at you like that. And, and he gets in the car and he drives me to Hogue, which is Newport Beach. And with the craziest thing, I was calling Joe like um, after I had called Marcel, I was trying to call Joe and he wasn't answering. And, you know, I'm sorry I'm even talking about this, but it's just the truth of my life. When I was walking into the emergency room. And I'm I'm literally like I'm talking I had fight shorts on, and just okay. blood, and then no shoes or nothing because I I had flip flops on and I had to kick my flip flops off and I was just <laughs> covered in blood. I walk into the front of Hogue and guess who's sitting there at the front of Hogue in the emergency room? It's Joe and his 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 wife Giselle. And that night, you know, I, they had a Giselle had had a miscarriage, wow. and Joe like Joe's a dark man. He he gets up. And he goes from dark to pale colored in like a second. He's like, what, what, what happened? And they literally are coming. Like, as soon as I walk in, nurses start coming and they take me straight to the back. And, and then, uh, yeah. And they start getting, they start wipe, wiping me down. That's a crazy coincidence. Bro, like, I, I remember sitting there, like, thinking. Like, you went in, getting in trouble, getting stabbed, getting in a fight. You walk in and you Master see. Master Joe's there. Your jiu-jitsu coach. Yeah. That was crazy. He was, was telling you to stay out of trouble. It was like, it was so ironic. It was so crazy. It was like, I didn't, I didn't listen to him. And so I felt yeah, like something yeah. bad happened for him. And 
And and then here I am, like, look at me. And he's like, he's like shocked. Like, what the fuck happened? Like, he isn't like, I don't think he had seen that, like, from one of his students like that, that he's like so close with yeah, already. Yeah. You know, and he's like, he's like shocked. So he's like, and then didn't let me talk to him. And That's then they crazy. separated God, me from. Man. Yeah, they separated me from Marcel too, and they just took me in the back. And then you know, police came, tried to ask me like, "Oh, you know what happened?" I'm like, ah. Take you. To I, I made. Hey, listen, I made the biggest fucking lie up. I was like, "Yeah, I was on the street, and they tried to hijack my car, and they punched, they beat me up, and they left. I I didn't know who they were. And then I said that some like street that I wasn't on. They were like, "Oh." There was a shooting on uh, over there. Like, are you sure you weren't involved with that? I was like, man, there was no shooting. Don't try and lie to me, bro. <laughs> Come on. And so, yeah. So I went home that night, stitched up. And I remember, like, I, I didn't want my parents to see me. So I kind of hid from them. And I, like, laid down in the living room and just went to sleep. I, and it, I, could, I, I tried to sleep for the whole night. I slept maybe, like, an hour. I just kept thinking, what just happened to you? Like, trying to comprehend yeah. it was crazy you know so i'm sitting there just like wow I'm, I'm touching these stitches and i'm thinking to myself like did you did you learn your lesson right did, did you know did you realize like where you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to be doing and, and why he had told you not to not to do that mm -hmm. and joe's joe's talked about this to a lot of people and yeah so that was the night that i realized like i'm done like that was no more streets for me no more no more homies, none of that. Yeah, so you so you obviously had to recover and, and take some time off of training for, I don't know, probably a few months, huh? Because I imagine if you're rolling on the floor and your head swishing no, you, around. No, you know, that, that's, that was the craziest like Carpet. Thing. That was the craziest <laughs> thing is, like, I went straight back. I, went, I was there, yeah, I was there with the stitches in, but, you know, I didn't train hard or anything, and nobody would touch my head, and, like, you know, it was a pretty traumatic incident. I just told, I, I, at the time, like, only a few people really knew what happened. I I had said like the coaches had told me don't you know tell people like what happened. Just tell them like you know you're a car accident or something. Mm -hmm. And I and I respected that. So that's kind of what I said. And but you know that's the reality of. And then later on everybody kind of found out like what had really happened. So, but yeah, that was the night I like I'm, I'm like you know what I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go out anymore. I'm not, I'm not gonna change in my life. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna do jujitsu. I'm gonna do MMA. I'm gonna do I'm gonna I'm going to do this rap music. Like I, I got, I can make it like, you know, I'm making money now, like selling CDs and, and yeah, like at the time I didn't really know if jujitsu was going to make me money or anything yeah. like that. And I wasn't really worried about that. I well, just I think want, you have like a, you know, you're a businessman, you're, you're an entrepreneur, like, you know, it's in your blood. So whatever you would have done, you know, you were going to ultimately make it, make you money. You know what I mean? So whether it's jujitsu, whether it's music, if you were, you know, selling clothes or whatever it was, like, you know, it, it was just going to be, you know, a part of you. So, but I, I want to, um, like, I don't know if you know this about me, but like, I grew up doing martial arts. So I got a black belt in Kenpo karate um, through a guy by the name of Steve Spry. And then after that, I did Taekwondo and got up to my red belt. Um, a lot of that was honorary because they, they, you know, I already kind of knew what I was doing on my feet and stuff like that. And, and then obviously boxing and did a lot of smoker fights and things like that. But it wasn't until I got into jujitsu uh, with you that I realized, oh shit, this stuff works. You know what I mean? Like, like in theory, you know, a lot, a lot of stuff can work. You know, someone, you know, someone goes to punch you and you're like, yeah. You know, you, you know, doing that kind of shit or throwing a side. Of course, you th you throw a crazy sidekick to someone, you're probably gonna fuck them up. Mm -hmm. But like, when it comes to ninety percent of fighting and being able to protect yourself, control a situation, it's one of those things that works. And so that's that's what I love about jujitsu is it's it's it seems to me one of the most efficient martial arts. And that's what I love about it. I want to know a couple of the things that like, what makes you like, you know, I, I, before I ask you that, um, I also love that, um, it teaches you patience. I like that, you know, you have to slow everything down and, and, and it's very technical. You have to understand the way that the body works and you're, 
your weight and shit. So it, it's like a way of playing chess with your limbs. And that's part I find really fascinating because in chess, you have to be at least three moves ahead, you know, and I find that it's, it's the same thing with jujitsu. So what are some of the things that you, I, I, I guess, I guess from your perspective of being a second or third degree, third degree, third degree black belt in jujitsu that you still like, you know, I mean, you, you obviously still do it every day, so you have to love it. You know, what's up? Yeah, I mean, when I when I needed it, I needed it. It was like, it was something, it was a release of, like, stress. It was like a, a place to be safe. It was like a family. It was like um, people that cared about you, um, it was people that would teach you, people that would be there for you. Um, I think it, it had a lot of different reasons for me. And I was actually surprised that people weren't just trying to like fuck fuck each other up, you know what I mean? Because you go into like a boxing gym, and you get into a scrap really quick. You know, someone hits you, then you hit them a little harder, then they hit you a little harder. Next thing you know, you guys are just going at it. You know, same thing with like you know, um, karate. Like you you start sparring. Next thing you know, you kick someone in the head. But with jujitsu, of, of course, you always have like those guys. They yeah. want to like you go know, super just, hard, just go super <laughs> hard, super fast, and and what do you call it? Scramble like yeah. like from the jump, but it's always seemed like very respectful, and I feel like that initial that initial tap is just kind of like a, a you know a, a matter of respect yeah. and saying like okay, cool, let's let's just kind of learn. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, in my time coming up, it was tough in the gym. It was tough in the gym. But I think with like my coach, like he was, you know, he was OG. He was old school, and he like wanted to make sure he had some really tough kids in there, and he did. And and I think as I started getting to a point where I was getting ready to teach all the time, he started telling me he's like, he's like, you you can't go hard all the time. You can't make everybody tap all the time. They go away. They go away. You need. You to change that and then I, that's when i remember i was like oh okay you know as the coach i need to be able to create an environment that people don't go away because you want the people so good for people they don't understand it you know for me it was like it's like when i say it saved my life it saved my life you know give me it gave me everything it took took me out the streets it, it gave me a family to to have it gave me you know a living like i i'm still to this day like it's got my back for no matter what. And for me, it's not just the jujitsu. It's also all the lessons that I've learned and what it's taught me about how to treat people and how to be, yeah. how to be humble and how to be good to people and how to take care of people and how to, how to, you know, just be a man, you know? And I and mean that right there, what you just said is like teaching you to kind of like humble your ego, right? Cause if you're just trying to tap people out all the time, you know, but saying, Oh no, let's, let's work and let's, you know, it, it's it's kind of like a subliminal way of, you know, killing your ego because you want them to come back. But I also think that, like, you can, like, you kind of have to not go hard all the time because you can actually hurt someone. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, like especially if you don't know what you're doing. There's there's a way to go hard, like, without going hard. Yeah. If you know what you're doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, for you know, we were all, uh, we've been rolling for how many years together? Yeah. You, you know, we, we used to do like 15, 20 minute rounds, no problem. And, you know, as well, like I never would I push you because I, that's what you need to get yeah. you better, so especially if when you train with the other guys. But like at the same time, I'm able to if I'm going to submit you in something, it's not going to be real fast to where you can't tap or, you know, to be slow and patient. And that's what I believe is is proper way to train with your training partners. And and that's as I grew older and taught more and more is what i learned what works you know so the jujitsu for me like again it's it's it saved my life it it you know it's taking care of my kids and my family and the other thing that's the most important thing to me now is, as a coach is um helping people yeah i think it's like that's one of the most beautiful things that jujitsu has gave me is put me in a position to be a, a head coach of a a bunch of amazing people that I train with and I get to be there for them. And I get to, if they have a problem, they know they can count on me more than just 
come into a class. Yeah. I think that's the important thing. Yeah, that's great, man. That's great. Yeah. And you got the music too. So you're you're really making the most out of two loves, two things that saved your life, two things that you love, two things that you're really good at. Yeah. Yeah. You know I mean, what I'm saying? Hey, you got one life, right? And the thing about it is if you're not chasing your passions and you're not doing whatever you can to chase your dream, then you might as well lay it down, in my opinion. You know that. I mean, like, look, think about all the times I bugged you about getting on the mic to record a song because it's that I have that passion inside me that I can't I can't give up on my dream. I want to I want to always chase it. I don't care how old I am. I might be old for rap music still, you know, and, and that's fine. But because this is a, it's a young man's game. But at the same time, like I'm that's not going to stop me from still doing my thing. And that's why I kind of built this YouTube channel. Where you know I kind of I'm I'm putting out techniques now I'm putting music with it that I like I love that and then at the same time I I'm hoping that people are gonna see a lot of music out of me as well on on my channel and I'm hoping that uh, I'll bring some cool shit for everybody yeah, you know you are we're getting you there are. you got a lot of cool stuff you got a lot of music out you got how many albums now I'm currently working on my tenth album yeah my last one was Legacy uh, Last of a Dying Breed. And uh, that one's available on like Spotify and stuff like that. And yeah, I mean, um, I'm just, uh, I'm just still chasing my dream. I'm, I'm now, I'm, I'm realizing that one of the things that I'm passionate about is talking to people about their experiences and what we could bring to the world and to the public that, you know, uh, could help somebody. Like I, I know a lot of things have helped me over the years, and I know I have a lot of experience in, in a lot of different avenues where whether it comes to the music whether it comes to um, martial arts, mixed martial arts, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, boxing. Um, and then on top of that, you know, life, yeah. streets, yeah. things that people have been through, uh, trials and tribulations. And I just want to bring people cool content and, and just um, also be a good voice for the jiu-jitsu community. Yeah, I think it's great, man, because you got to go through it to be able to help someone through it. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? And, and you've... And with the music, you got the experience. So I believe you can help people with that. Uh, the jujitsu, obviously, you know, you, you tried, true, and tested uh, with that. And, and just, you know, the life experience, you know, you can help people with that through through all these, you know, different platforms. And now the podcast. Now the podcast. So, man, yes, keep, sir. <laughs> you know, just keep keep doing what you're doing, man. Like, I, I've, I've always believed in you. I always got your back. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see. I appreciate the album. Um, it's going to be crazy, man. I appreciate you finish do, it up. You know, saying that because you were one of the main guys that was telling me 10 years ago, like you should be posting clips of the stuff, your the jiu-jitsu moves that you do. You should be doing this. And, you know, like at that time I was like, I, I still was like, Oh, like, how do I do it? You know, like, <laughs> and then, you know, I, I didn't take it too serious and I should have, but yeah. you know, the, the thing is, it's, 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 everyone needs to know it. It's that it's, Better late than never. Well, yeah, you know it's I mean? it's never too late. And, you know, I tell a lot of people a lot of things to do. You're actually doing it now. You know what I mean? I can't tell you how many people say they want it. They say they're, you know, they're going to do it, but they don't do it. You're here doing it. So yeah, I congratulations, gotta, man. We, we got to do it. Thank you, bro. And uh, right now, uh, what, what are you working on, bro? Like, just, the, you know, let people know, like, what so you got going stuff. on. Because I want, I want, I mean, dude, you do it all, bro. Like, so you got any projects coming out? You got any artists that, besides me, like, forgive <laughs> me. Um, I, I'm going to thank you for everything you've done for me musically. Like, of course, man. Been, of course, I always recorded, got you, like, four or five of my albums. Every song that I have that sounds good is because of you. Um, but yeah, like what you got going on? You got yeah, just a you lot. Got Stephon you know, Benz. Uh, yeah, I know you got yeah, Stephon Benz. Got, got Stephon Benz working on some consulting projects. I've uh, been directing a lot of music videos. Uh, just trying to find my lane and do what I love and focus on. You know, just always improving every single day. I, I think that's kind of like the tip that I'm on right now is just making sure that you know I'm spending my time in the right places and I'm making sure that uh, you know I, I, I'm really focusing on what I'm good at. Yep. So and and with that, I try to get better every day. So um, it's exciting, man. I, I, I'm happy, and you know, I'm traveling the world, and you know, just want to keep it, just keep it moving. That's the way to do it, yeah. brother. Yeah. And do you have a, like a uh, any like 
social media you want to tag on here so uh so people can contact you because i know you yeah, do yeah. i i've you've made my music come to life and uh, you know maybe some sometimes you people need somebody in their corner man and and i know how important it is to have a coach or a, a, someone that will guide you and if you're a talented uh musician or a rapper or or any kind of music uh my boy here he can definitely make you sound the way you're supposed to sound, the way you want to sound. So do you want to give your... Yeah, no, I appreciate that, man. And I, I feel like I'm kind of like, you know, you're like the you're like the jujitsu coach that helps people. I feel like I'm the I'm the Mr. Miyagi of the music business. You know what I mean? Right now, like <laughs> like I, I'm you know, I'm trying to teach people to, you know, catch flies, you know, with with their fingers, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So um, I really focus on the development and, and, you know, making good music and, and helping people in, in, in that, you know, with both acting um, in music videos and people that want to do production podcasts like this, um, but especially, you know, in the music game with, with, you know, singers, songwriters, producers, um, we're just, we're just really building a family and just trying to take it to the next level. So, um, but yeah, I have a company, Imaginative Media, um, imaginative-media.com. Um, you can hit me up at, uh, at Hit Music Partners. Um, and my handle is, uh, at Manny Mihadas. Motherfucking man. Yeah, bro. I appreciate it. Um, blessed to, to be surrounded by you, bro. I appreciate you coming through the podcast and, there was no better way for me to start off the initial podcast by kind of, you know, talking to my boy that is in the music industry that I've known for a really long time that, you know, has seen me kind of go from, you know, selling CDs in the streets. You know, I'm just so your, glad you're doing your, it, man. I'm actually, granny. I'm really happy to be episode one, man. Yeah, brother. Let's go. Let's Appreciate get it. it. Appreciate you. Like, subscribe to the channel, and we will be having lots of more stuff coming out for you guys soon. Appreciate y'all. Peace.